All right, so this next test is just on one chapter, um, so it's gonna come pretty rapidly. The endocrine system we'll have three lectures on, and then we'll have a review day, and then we'll have the exam. So don't let yourself get behind on this. Um, keep up with it, because before you know it, we're gonna be testing on it. It's kind of nice because the test is small. You don't have so much information to concentrate on and to look at, um, but it's gonna come up on you really, really fast, so just stick with it. By the end of the chapter, you guys should be able to compare the different types of glands that we have, endocrine and exocrine, and describe the different types of intercellular communication. So the different ways that cells tend to communicate with each other, um, whether it's direct communication or endocrine communication or synaptic. Um, you should also be able to compare and contrast the regulatory mechanisms of the nervous system and the endocrine system. Those are the two main systems that control and regulate the body. They do it in very different ways. Um, so we'll look at the difference between the endocrine system and the nervous system. You guys should be able to talk about the different classes of hormones. Um, we'll cover those today and the significance of a hormone having a binding protein. You guys should be able to talk about the general mechanisms of hormonal action. Um, what I mean by that is just like what happens when a hormone binds to a three receptor? Like what does it do to that cell? What can it do to that cell? Um, does it bind extracellularly or intracellularly and why? Um, we'll go over those today as well. So this first part is essentially almost every one of these objectives. That means that this objective is huge. This objective is the entire second and third lecture. So this part two and part three of the lectures, we're gonna go over the location of each of the endocrine organs. So like the pineal gland, the pituitary gland, the thyroid gland, the pancreas. Um, we'll talk about the hormones that come from each of these glands and then the functions of them. Okay, so what, what is, when do we release the hormone? What does the hormone do, um, et cetera. We'll also talk about, I don't have the hypothalamus listed here, but we'll also talk about the hypothalamus because it has a really, really big role in regulating the endocrine system. Um, and I have a chart that I'll post for you guys to kind of like take this information and organize it if I haven't posted it already. Um, it's just kind of like like Excel spreadsheet or just like a basic chart and it'll just say like, this is the gland, these are the hormones, what makes them, where'd they go, what do they do? And you guys will just kind of fill it in. Um, I recommend that you not fill it in during class because you're just gonna be like trying to cram information in or not actually learning anything. Mm -hmm. So come to class, pay attention, take notes, and then later go home and take that information and put it under the chart. Um, and the chart will be really helpful for your study, for you to study from. All right guys, so this whole chapter is on the endocrine system. Um, the endocrine system is a regulatory system, so it regulates the body. It's one of the master control systems for the body. When we talk about the endocrine system and the way that it regulates the body, we say that it regulates long-term processes. Okay, we'll see this as opposite from the nervous system. The nervous system is like really fast, short-term stuff, right? Like, I'm gonna walk, my muscles have to move rapidly. Um, senses come in really rapidly. The endocrine system is not rapid. This is a slow regulatory system that regulates things that are gonna change over a long period of time for a long extended time period. So the endocrine system is gonna regulate things like growth and development. Obviously that's a really slow process, right? Your body grows because of hormones coming from the endocrine system, whether that's growth hormone um, or thyroid or testosterone or estrogen. Um, these hormones regulate the growth and then the development of our body, both development as we age and then sexual development as well. Um, the endocrine system also regulates some of the drives that essentially make us like living things, the things that keep us going. So sleep, right? We all have that drive to sleep. We all get sleepy um, and that's a hormonal regulatory system. Um, same thing with hunger and thirst. So we've got hormones that are important in telling us when we're hungry, when we're full when we're thirsty, when we're not thirsty. Um, sex drive, okay, so that sex drive is a hormonal thing. And again, that's important. That's not just like a pleasure thing. That's to keep the race going. Um, and then finally, reproduction. So the endocrine system is important for reproduction for multiple ways. One, just development of the reproductive system. But there's this big difference between an eight-year-old and an 18-year-old, um, whether you're male or female, when you look at what's happening with the reproductive organs. And that whole process of going through puberty and developing the secondary sex characteristics and um, having a functioning reproductive system is all directed by hormones. 
So when we look at the endocrine system, the endocrine system primarily includes a bunch of endocrine glands. So those are all the organs we're gonna be looking at. Like, you know, when we did whatever, cardiovascular, we had the heart, the vessels, and the blood. Well, when we do endocrine, we're just looking at glands, lots and lots of glands. And each of these glands are gonna be responsible for producing different hormones. When we look at hormones, hormones are just chemical messengers, right? So it's literally a chemical that goes from one cell to another cell and gives it a message, tells it what to do or what to stop doing. Um, the key with hormones though, is that as the hormones are released from these endocrine glands and they travel to their target, they travel through the bloodstream. Mm. Third time's a charm. <laughs> they travel through the blood to get to their target. Okay, so like when we talked about neurotransmitters, they're also chemical messengers, but they don't travel through the bloodstream, right? They travel just right across that little synaptic cloud. Um, so whenever we're talking about hormones in the endocrine system, we're gonna be looking at chemical messengers that are traveling through the bloodstream to get to their target cell. So we said that the endocrine system utilizes endocrine glands. So we need to take just a quick second to talk about what is an endocrine, endocrine gland and to kind of compare and contrast endocrine versus exocrine glands. When we look at glands in general, glands make secretions, right? They produce some, some sort of chemical component that they're going to release or secrete out of a cell. Endocrine glands are gonna make these secretions and release them into the bloodstream. Okay, initially, they, they don't go directly into the blood. Initially, um, they'll get like released into the, in, the interstitial fluid and then they enter into the bloodstream. But the key here is that these secretions that come from endocrine glands are going to be traveling through the bloodstream. Then once these secretions get to their target cell, they tell that target cell to do something. So what ends up happening is intracellular. Like they could go to a target cell and say, hey, start making this protein. Then the cell starts making a protein. That's an intracellular effect, right? That's, how, that's a change in the cell. Or they could go to a, a cell and they, should, they could say, hey, you need to start metabolizing this really rapidly. So then they'll start metabolizing really rapidly. That's a change that's happening inside the cell. Okay, endocrine glands release hormones into the bloodstream and they have intracellular effects. Exocrine glands are different. We've already talked about lots of exocrine glands, um, whether you realized it or not last semester, sweat glands, sebaceous glands, serminous glands. These are all exocrine glands. They make secretions, but their secretions are released via ducts. And those ducts carry the secretion to some sort of a surface. Okay, so the secretions are released onto some sort of an epithelial surface. So they are not going to have intracellular effects, right? Their effects are going to be extracellular. They're not binding to receptors and telling cells what to do. Everything they're doing is outside of cells. So for example, sweat glands. Sweat glands produce sweat, it goes through a duct, and it's released onto our greatest epithelial surface, right, the surface of the skin. And as it sweats, it cools us off. It's not changing anything inside any cell, right? That is an extracellular effect from an exocrine gland. Um, <clears throat> you can match up the X and X. Um, mucus glands. Same thing, mucus glands make mucus and they release it onto an epithelial surface. That could be in the vagina, that could be in parts of the GI tract, that could be in the nasal cavity, um, in the trachea, the bronchi, wherever. It's make, they're making mucus releasing it through a duct onto the surface, okay? And that effect is extracellular, whether it's trapping bacteria or um, providing moisture or protection or whatever. Um, we also have a lot of exocrine glands in the GI tract. We'll talk about that when we do GI, um, but like in the stomach, the glands secrete stomach acid, hydrochloric acid into the stomach. They're releasing secretions through a duct onto the surface. Um, the glands that release digestive enzymes into the small intestine and from the, from the pancreas into the small intestine, um, from the gallbladder, like all of these would be considered exocrine secretions because they're being released onto a surface and they're having extracellular effects. They're not changing anything inside a cell. So our focus obviously is just gonna be on the endocrine glands. 
right? We just need to discuss it really briefly, just so that you can kind of see, okay, what does that mean? Like, what is the point of calling something an endocrine gland as opposed to an exocrine gland? So these next two slides are just showing us kind of an overview of the endocrine system. Um, I'm not gonna go through the specific hormones in detail because again, we're gonna spend two full lectures doing that. Um, I just want you to kind of see that these glands are literally all over the body um, and they're all very different, different sizes, different locations, different functions, different shapes, different makeup, everything. We'll start off up here in the brain with the hypothalamus and then remember the pituitary gland that hangs from the hypothalamus. And then in the back of the brain, we'll also do the pineal gland. Um, if you move down into the cervical region or the neck, we have a couple glands there that we'll look at. Um, we'll look at the thyroid gland, which is actually gonna be labeled on the next slide. But this kind of butterfly shape right here is the thyroid gland. And then the thyroid curves around your trachea like this. And on the back of it, we have four tiny little glands that we call parathyroid glands. Parathyroid, they're around the thyroid gland. But they would actually be in the back. So like it curves around like that and they're on the back parts of the thyroid gland. Really, really little. Here, so this is where the thyroid gland is listed. Um, the adrenal glands, what does renal refer to? Kidneys. Kidneys, so think of like added to the kidneys. The adrenal glands are these little pyramid shaped glands that are right on top of either kidney. The other kidney is back here so you can't quite see it. Um, the pancreas releases insulin and glucagon which are both really important for um, glucose metabolism and keeping our blood sugar levels normal. And then um, all of these over here, these organs are actually part of other systems, right? So like the ovaries or the testes are obviously part of the reproductive system, but they make a lot of hormones. Uh, we talked about the heart. Remember the heart releases the natriuretic peptides, A and P and B and P, in order to decrease blood volume. Now the heart is part of the cardiovascular system, not the endocrine system. But all of these organs that you see listed here have some secondary endocrine function. Okay, so it's not their primary purpose in life, but they do secrete hormones that have an effect on the endocrine system. These we go through um, as we go through that body system. So again, we've already mentioned the nature of uretic peptides. We mentioned thymosin from the thymus, remember in T-cell um, division and differentiation. And as we go through the rest of these, we'll mention all of the other hormones. We are gonna specifically focus um, for the most part on the endocrine organs for this chapter. So before we get into the specifics of the endocrine system, system, we'll take a second to compare the different ways that cells communicate with each other. And we have four broad categories of intracellular communication or ways that one cell can send a message to another cell, right, to communicate. We'll talk through direct communication, paracrine, and then endocrine and synaptic as well on the next slide, or the next couple slides. Direct communication is pretty rare. Um, direct communication happens when you have two cells that are right next to each other and they communicate directly. So, the chemical messengers, the ions, whatever it is that you're using to send a message goes directly from this cytoplasm in this cell over to the cytoplasm of this cell. Okay, so you exchange things between adjacent cells. You do that via gap junctions. Remember we looked at gap junctions before um, in the cardiovascular system when we looked at the heart. Remember we said that the ions will flow from one um, cardiac muscle cell to the next cardiac muscle cell through the, the gap junctions, through the little tunnels that interconnect the cells. So the chemical messenger is not going out here into the extracellular fluid or the interstitial fluid. It's not going out into the bloodstream. It's not going anywhere else. It's literally going directly from one cell to the next cell, hence being called direct communication. Um, this only happens between two cells of the same type that are in direct contact with each other. Okay, so this is, again, it, it's relatively rare um, we see this, what did we just say? What did we just mention where we see it? <clears throat> Good, so to coordinate contraction in a cardiac muscle. 
if you remember this from like the very, very beginning of the semester, last semester, um, but we also have them, we utilize them to coordinate cilia movement in areas where we have cilia. So like in the trachea um, and other areas of the respiratory tract, because remember when you've got all of these cilia sticking out like this, and they're all supposed to move rhythmically to push mucus across them. They need to communicate somehow to know, like when to be pushed, what, you know, like the rowers. Think about the rowers, how they all communicate, right? To go at the same speed, the same pace. Um, the cilia, these cells need to know, okay, when do they push? When do they pull back? When do they push? When do they pull back? So they utilize direct communication to keep in contact to coordinate that movement. But again, pretty rare, um, doesn't happen a ton. Paracrine communication um, is very, very common. Paracrine communication happens all the time. Um, this is when chemical messengers go from cell to cell within one little area, within one tissue. So whatever the chemical messenger is, it's traveling just through the extracellular fluid to one of the neighboring cells. Okay, so within any type of tissue that you have, this is constantly going on. The osteocyte will communicate you know, through the little canalicula with another osteocyte. Right, the myocyte will communicate with another myocyte just through the extracellular fluid. So this is all really local. And again, this is constantly occurring. Um, examples of paracrine factors or things that would be used in paracrine communication include things like prostaglandins. Um, we see a lot of things that we call local growth factors. But again, this just means you've got one cell, you've got another cell over here. All of this is the interstitial fluid, right? Or the extracellular fluid outside the cells. This guy can release something and it can travel over here and give some sort of information to this guy. Traveling through the extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid. Endocrine communication. Um, we've already mentioned this a few times. But this involves endocrine glands that release chemicals called hormones. And how do hormones get from one cell to the next? Through the bloodstream. Through the bloodstream. Okay, so we started out with direct communication going directly from one cell to the next, through the cytoplasm. Then we did paracrine communication, where we travel out through the extracellular fluid. Now with endocrine communication, the hormones are actually traveling through the bloodstream. And again, that's going to be really important when we start to look at the way that endocrine communication works. Endocrine communication can be really, really varied. Like it can do all sorts of different things. Um, but essentially, we're going to alter the metabolic activities of cells and tissues and organs all over the body. Okay, so when you think about that, that kind of makes sense. If this cell is releasing this hormone, and the hormone's not just going right here, it's not just going right to this guy here, it's actually entering into the blood. Where's the blood gonna go? Everywhere. Everywhere. Right, so hormones have the ability to go from one little gland and get spread out everywhere, all over the whole body. So endocrine communication has a very, very widespread effect. You can affect tissues and organs all over the body. Now, in order for a cell to be affected or receive that message from endocrine communication, the target cell has to have a very specific receptor that can bind to that hormone. Okay, so if I, that, what I mean by that is that one hormone doesn't affect every single cell in the body. It only affects the cells that are sensitive to it. And a cell is sensitive when it has a receptor that will bind to that hormone. So if I, if I release whatever, hormone X, and all of this hormone X is in the bloodstream and it's traveling, and I've got a cell here, a cell here, and a cell here. This one has the receptor for X. This one does not. This one has the receptor for X. That means that the hormone X is gonna come tell this cell what to do and come tell this cell what to do. This cell will not do anything. It doesn't have the receptor to bind to the hormone, so that's not one of the target cells. Nothing's gonna happen in that cell. Okay, so it has a really widespread effect, but it doesn't necessarily affect everything in the body. Okay, only the specific target cells. When we look at hormones, hormones can work in um, lots of different ways. Okay, again, I said they have very varied effects. 
they can start to stimulate the synthesis of enzymes or um, structural proteins that were not being made before in a cell. They do this by activating genes. Um, if you think about it, every, all of your cells have all of the DNA, right? Remember your DNA is a recipe, has recipes to make proteins. And every cell has the full set, has every single recipe, even if it doesn't make everything. So a hormone can go to a cell and it can say, hey, I know you weren't making this before, but you need to make it now. Let's activate this gene, which is a recipe, and now you can make this protein. Okay, so it can activate genes and turn on sections of DNA so that cells can start making proteins or enzymes that they weren't previously making. It can also increase or decrease the rate of synthesis of something that it was already making. Okay, so if your cell, say, was already producing glucose, um, and it can say, okay, more, we need more glucose, you need to start making this faster. So it'll increase that metabolism, it'll increase those chemical reactions, um, those enzymatic reactions to make glucose. Okay, or the opposite, you can slow it down as well. Um, any type of, of reaction can be adjusted via hormones. Um, we can also turn existing enzymes or channels on or off. We see this a lot with channels because when you change their shape, they can stop working or they can start working. Um, and some hormones can do this. Uh, for example, insulin. Um, insulin is needed in order for many of our channels for glucose to work. Right? So many of our cells cannot take glucose into them if insulin, the hormone, does not bind. Okay, so insulin binds, that changes the shape of the channel, now that now it can actually move insulin into the cell. Okay, so we utilize hormones to turn on these different um, membrane transport mechanisms as well. Uh, we'll talk about all of these effects really specifically as we go through each hormone. Just for right now, understand they do lots of different things that affect metabolism, um, growth, long-term changes. So, overall, endocrine communication results in long-lasting changes that are widespread, or you could say widespread changes that are long-lasting. I don't know which way I actually want to do there. Uh, but the point here is, yes, they're widespread. We already know that, right? The hormone travels through the bloodstream, so it goes everywhere. So you have really widespread effects. They're long-lasting um, because if you think about it, these are, these are long-lasting type effects, right? If I go to a cell and I activate a gene and to tell it to start making something new, that's not instantaneous. Right? That's first off, gradual. You can add gradual, as in it takes a long time to happen. You turn the gene on, then transcription occurs, then translation occurs, then you start to build up the protein. Like that takes time. Um, but then also, once you do it, that, that lasts a long time. Once you make that protein, it doesn't in instantly disappear. It's hanging out for a while. So this gives us really nice, long lasting changes. Synaptic communication is our last type of intercellular communication. And we've already seen this quite a bit when we did the muscular system, when we did neuro, we saw a lot of synaptic communication. Synaptic communication occurs when you have a neurotransmitter, okay, so not a hormone, but a neurotransmitter that travels across this tiny little space across this little bitty synaptic cleft to then come bind to the target cell. So if you look at this and you notice that the neurotransmitter is released so close to its target that it's very likely that this neurotransmitter is only going to affect this cell, right? It's not, that neurotransmitter is not gonna somehow get out of here, race over here and affect a cell over there. It's not it's only going to affect this target that it was intended to affect right there. So synaptic communication is limited to a very specific area. It does not have widespread effects. Um, when we look at synaptic communications, the effects are very rapid. Okay, and you could also say short-lived. So this happens super quick. Think about muscles, right? Like when we tell our muscles to contract, that's synaptic communication. We have our motor neuron, it releases acetylcholine, that comes over here and tells the muscle to contract. And it's like that. Super, super quick, which it should be. 
Imagine if it took you three minutes to propel every muscle to contract, right? Maybe like sloths, works. Um, it, it, it would not be a very efficient system. But also imagine if it lasted a long time. If every time you contracted your muscle, it took five minutes for like the wear off. Like that's ridiculous, right? You need some really rapid and short-lived communication. So that's what synaptic communication is. Um, I'm not gonna go through all these pictures, guys. These are essentially all the different types of communication. Okay, so direct, directly from cell to cell through gap junctions, paracrine through the extracellular fluid, endocrine hormones go into the bloodstream, synaptic neurotransmitters go across the synaptic cleft. So those are the four types of communication. We have two regulatory systems that kind of utilize those.